Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Scott Sugden, Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at All Acoustics. Today we have a presentation all about uh, AVB Milan and how uh, L Acoustics is using AVB Milan to connect devices on networks easier than ever before. Uh, presenters today, Etienne, how are things with you, my friend? Uh, you are coming to us live from sunny Paris, it looks like. Yeah, exactly. Hi, everybody. So uh, everything's good and uh, looking forward to this presentation. Excellent. Thank you. And Etienne, we brought along a uh, uh, a stellar team, a commando squad of AVB networks. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And your uh, co-presenter, Genyo Kroner. Genyo, you're coming to us from uh, just uh, just not far away. Let's see, Genyo's first time on the webinar. Let's see if he unmutes his mic. Genyo, how are you today? He does not unmute his mic. So Genyo is uh, first one to hit the beer policy. So here at the L Acoustics webinar series, if you forget to unmute your mic. You're... OK, um, I just learned something that I need to unmute it also in addition <laughs> on the PC. All right. My Welcome, Genyo. Thank you for joining us today. Genyo, you are Director of Electronics and is it is I'm sorry, I forgot the entire title. Uh, Director of Electronics and, uh, and Amplification at Alacoustics, correct? Um, Director of Electronics, so I'm responsible for everything that has uh, electronics inside at Alacoustics. Excellent. And uh, you've also been a, a founding member of the Milan work group uh, between ourselves and several of our good friends in the industry. Yes, correct. Excellent. And joining us today uh, in front of the camera for the first time, I think, uh, uh, Guillaume, how are you today, sir? I don't hear you, Guillaume. I don't know why. It says you're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. Um, so there you are. I think I, I think I got you. Nope, I don't. Uh, Guillaume is joining us as well today. Guillaume is one of the newest members of the L Acoustics family. Uh, uh, well, Guillaume gets that figured out, um, we'll jump back to him in a second. Yeah. Uh, oh, I hear you, Guillaume. There you are. Good morning. How are you? Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. It, yeah, thank you. So Guillaume, you're going to join us as well. You've got a lot of expertise on uh, this side of the uh, world, which is networked audio, and you've done a lot of the fundamental research to help uh, with this presentation as well, have you not? Yes, yes, yes that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got a long experience with uh, audio over IP using, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to talk about AVB today. Excellent, thank you. So joining us, uh, uh, helping out you guys in the uh, question and answer side, I brought along some great moderators. Uh, let's start with my good friend down south, Alex Soto. Alex, how are you in Guadalajara? God, everything's good, you know, as usual, a beautiful day here. So which is great for uh, such an interesting in seminar, sorry, or webinar. Uh, Welcome everyone, bienvenidos amigos hispanohablantes. Una vez más aquí estamos acompañándolos. Eh, hoy va a ser un día muy interesante, así que siéntanse con toda la confianza hacer sus preguntas en español. Aquí los atenderemos. Gracias por acompañarnos. Thank you, Scott. Excellent. Let's head across the ocean. Uh, Sergey, how are you? Uh, how's the brick wall doing today? Uh, I'm all good, thank you. And uh, it's getting warmer and warmer in the UK, and I've already managed to get some <laughs> sunburn. And uh, today I'm I'm going to be answering only the most basic questions in the moderated panel because we have really some some really powerful experts uh, among the moderators and presenters so i'm going to be the one only looking after the basic questions excellent well uh and sergey you'll also be able to help people with anything they might have specifically in russian so if you have uh, questions in russian and if it's your first time coming to the webinar and didn't realize it sergey will be able to help you as well if that's an easier way to communicate tony let's bounce up to you uh you're what about a two hour drive away uh well this day and age it's maybe 90 minutes with there's no traffic out there yeah no traffic i should be able to get to sergey's place in or oh, maybe about two hours all good. Yeah, good yeah good uh, he's got excellent. better weather than me but it's looking pretty good for the weekend out there Good, excellent. Um, so Tony, you're going to help out moderating questions as well. Uh, it looks like you're going to you, you need to do some dusting on your cabinets. Um, everyone will uh, let you know that. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, next week um, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll have you join us as well on some of the topics. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and I'm going to bounce over to uh, uh, Germany real quick. Uh, Thomas, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Scott, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining so, us. So I'm joining the 
good uh, webinar today and I hope you have uh, many questions about this um, great stuff we will hear. And if you have questions in Germany, you can uh, also type your questions in German as well. So have fun. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. And last and most definitely not least, uh, the expert among experts, Mark Bernard. It's good to have you join us again. Hello, Scott. Uh, you're making too too much an expert of me, but uh, I'm glad to join and I'll try to answer questions in the Q&A chat uh, uh, as best as possible. Et bien sûr, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français pour, pour tous nos amis francophones, il n'y a aucun problème. So uh, enjoy the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Uh, well, Etienne, I'm going to hand it over to you. So thank you, Etienne. Um, and uh, please uh, take us on our journey through all things uh, AVB and Milan Audio Networks. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you for hosting these webinars and uh, I'm happy to uh, to start on that topic. Uh, that's actually uh, quite an important topic for us uh, and we have a lot of uh, upcoming, uh, let's say, software products along those lines and uh, it's quite good to have uh, this opportunity also to explain uh, uh, why we made that choice of going for uh, AVB Milan and why it's becoming really uh, our state of the art and our recommended option for uh, audio distribution in conjunction with control. So uh, as uh, an acoustic system today, uh, I mean, when we look at the portfolio of products that we're capable of, uh, of addressing these days, it has grown beyond uh, the simple uh, loudspeaker system, but also adding uh, amplified controllers, adding uh, front-end processors, and therefore the topic of control and audio distribution has become a major topic for us, uh, with the ability to, uh, to control tens to uh, sometimes hundreds of amplified controllers and make sure that the audio gets distributed through in the most qualitative and, uh, and uh, flexible manner, as well as control for monitoring and controlling all these devices. Uh, this is a topic for the entire audio industry, I would say, but for sound reinforcement, which is our core business, we have really uh, some specificities and requirements. It needs to be easy to operate and highly reliable. Uh, because uh, we are actually in an industry that lives like uh, extremely fast paced, like it's not uh, seldom to build a show and uh, break it down uh, in the same during the same day. It's even quite common. So that means everything should work and be extremely reliable and easy to operate. Uh, often like audio needs to be distributed to tens or even hundreds of amplified controllers. Uh, so we can have fairly large installations and it needs to be easy and fast. And what's also common is that we have to deal with large distances, which can sometimes be above and well above 100 meters. And this has to work straight. This needs to happen obviously without any audible degradation because we're aiming at the highest possible quality. So the first thing, first thing absolutely necessary is no dropouts. The worst thing that can happen is that we don't have audio at all. So we can't allow for that. That's uh, definitely a must. We need to be able to assure like an extended frequency response, like from uh, uh, basically the entire audio spectrum. We need to have a high dynamic range and signal and very high signal to noise ratio, so very low noise uh, that's due to the transmission. And we need also to have a very high timing accuracy among amplified controllers and which calls for absolutely deterministic latency and timing. And why do we need that? It's because in our typical application, the timing and the phase is critical. So for two particular topics. Uh, the first one being typically multiple loudspeakers in the same room, which would be paired for stereo or multi-channel audio. Like we all know, if the phase or timing is not accurate when you are located uh, in the middle of two loudspeakers for stereo, the image is going to get blurred. Uh, it's also the case for multi-channel audio, so that's a topic for regular multi-channel audio, but also for our ELISA technology. And then there's another topic in which it's extremely important is when we have multiple speakers in a line source that are fed with multiple 
amplified controllers, which is really common uh, in, a, in a large format uh, line source, where often you would have one amplifier for one or two units, two elements, sometimes three, but uh, uh, you're sure to have more than one along the line, and you need to make sure that all of these amplified controllers are perfectly in time, so that you can have the best possible uh, wavefront reconstruction out of the line source. So all the effort that you've done to uh, properly adjust the display angles, to uh, optimize the electronic filters could get destroyed or at least like impacted uh, by the fact that not all the units along the line are properly uh, time aligned. So this is a must. This is very important to us. Networking and sound reinforcement is something that has happened, let's say, naturally. And uh, even today, like any uh, system of a reasonable size uh, at L-Acoustics has a network. And this is primarily because we needed to switch from uh, the control of uh, our amplified controllers to be solely on front panels and move towards a more centralized control and uh, um, for control and monitoring through software and that's known as LA Network Manager and I guess you're all familiar with that uh, by now. So that means we already have a, uh, a network in place for these amplified controllers. And the big question there is to know if there is an opportunity uh, to use the network infrastructure to transport the audio as well. And uh, that's the question that we had at the moment, like we wanted, we tested different, uh, different protocols and we'll guide you through this journey of, let's say first, like the typical type of, uh, of formats uh, that are already existing for audio distribution. And then like at the second time, a bit later, like uh, the other type of audio protocols uh, over uh, Ethernet or over IP that are existing. And then that's uh, and show that they have some defects that we could not really allow. Uh, therefore, like we want and we will explain why we went into Milan. So we'll go deep into Milan to explain like all the let's say all the qualities and the reliability, inherent reliability of the format. And we'll have several more uh, topics later on to explain uh, the, let's say the portfolio of products that are supporting Milan in the air acoustics uh, uh, product range. And we'll have some uh, application case studies and we'll have uh, even more uh, at the end, uh, a small demo uh, by Scott to show you how it works uh, in reality with a P1 and uh, an amplified controller in a small scale in that, uh, in that term, because we don't have access at this point to very large scale installation. So I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Guillaume uh, will be uh, guiding you a little bit through uh, these uh, audio transport technologies as we have them today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? No, you don't hear me. Do you hear me now? Perfectly. Okay. Don't understand. So, uh, as I can say, uh, we are going to have an overview of all uh, the audio transport technologies that we have been used uh, for, for several years. And uh, uh, we are going to start just with, uh, with of course, analog audio. And uh, we, we will try to explain to you why we have chosen to, to use some of, the, of those technologies and why we have uh, chosen to not use uh, some, of, some of those. So we are going to, to talk about analog audio. After that, uh, the, the next evolution is, of course, AACBU. And uh, we will have, uh, as you can say, the short view of uh, audio over Ethernet and uh, a less shorter view audio over IP. And after that, we will see how and why we think that IGB can overcome uh, those limitations. Okay, let's start with uh, analog transmission. So uh, I think you all know that uh, analog transmission is a point-to-point -point distribution of one channel over one cable. In our field, uh, which is uh, pro audio industry, we use a balanced line and a three point XLR connector. That is uh, our standard. Uh, in analog transmission, we, 
we transmit uh, voltage vari variations, so is that are proportional to the original acoustic wave. Uh, it means that uh, if we pick up uh, an acoustic wave uh, with a microphone, uh, the, the electric signal that is generated is within the same range of frequencies than uh, the acoustic wave. If we have an acoustic wave of one kilohertz, we have an electrical signal of one kilohertz. Wow. Uh, and uh, for the level, in uh, again in our per audio industry field, we use uh, DBU as a reference for electric level, and uh, zero DBU means 0 0.775 volts. Uh, the, in, in, in any in many devices, uh, the nominal reference is plus four DBU, which is 1.23 volts. Uh, okay, thank you, Etienne. Uh, so now for the analog transmission, uh, what are the pros and the cons? The pros are, uh, of course, simplicity of use. If they simply, it's the simplest way of uh, of using uh, of transmitting uh, another signal. It's plug and play. It's uh, it's real this time. It's not uh, it's not marketing. And uh, of course, we have uh, no latency as uh, we have uh, no latency in the analog audio world, except uh, maybe the the time to, for the signal to 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 to, to travel along the cable uh, at the speed of uh, something like 0.7, the speed of light. And uh, the cons, the cons. Uh, the big cons are the, the signal may be altered over long distances, but uh, uh, also uh, for medium distances. We could have a low signal to noise ratio, uh, which is a big issue for us because, because we, we play a music program at uh, loud levels. And uh, if we have a noise at high level, it, it's a, a real problem. We can have hum uh, because of uh, ground loops often. Um, Often, if we have a different power supply uh, in our installation, we can have a hum. It's a big problem sometimes. Uh, and uh, we have, even if we use balanced lines, we can have a, a lot of problems with uh, electromagnetic interference. And of course, again, uh, we have one signal, signal in one cable except with multicore, but as you know, multicore is a group of many cables. It's not uh, many signals in one cable. So after analog audio, we, we had a big breakup with a digital audio and a, a way of transmitting uh, digital audio, which is uh, AECBU uh, since uh, 1985, uh, something like that. Uh, like analog transmission, it's a point to point distribution. This time we have two channels of uh, one uh, balanced line. Uh, it's a special, some of special cable because it's a cable with an impedance of 110 ohms, but it uses uh, the same connector, the same XLR connector uh, as for analog. Um, we uh, we don't transmit any more uh, voltage variations that represents acoustic uh, variations. We transmit uh, uh, bits which are zero, uh, zero or one. Uh, the audio is encoded with the PCM uh, system, which is pulse code modulation. Uh, the media clock is embedded in the signal, and we can have media clock from uh, for 44.1 uh, kilohertz to uh, 192 kilohertz. So we we transmit uh, bits uh, that are uh, zero or one, and uh, it is uh, with a form of block in IOSCBU. Uh, a block, an audio block, is uh, divided into 192 frames. And the frames is divided into two sub frames, one for the channel E and the other one for the channel D. And each sub frame is a time slot of 32 bits. Uh, in uh, these uh, 32 bits, we have, of course, uh, our audio data. In first, we have four bits of preamble for, for helping the, the synchronization. 
After that, we have 24 bits of audio data uh, in PCM format. And uh, after that, we have four bits of metadata. Uh, in, th in these four bits, we have uh, uh, one bit, which is a parity bit. Uh, it, uh, it helps us to it, it helps the receiver to check if uh, is, uh, if uh, all the transmission is uh, is okay. And uh, we have another bit uh, uh, which form a word of uh, 192 bits. Uh, in each block, we have two words. Uh, in those words, we can uh, we can say what we what we want, the name of the song or something uh, like that. So it's. Uh, ASCPU, uh, it's, uh, it's the first time we can transmit other things like audio. We can transmit metadata as well as, as audio. So we, with ASCPU, we, we have a new, uh, new thing to, to be careful about. It is uh, synchronization, of course. Uh, ASCPU is a synchronous signal. We have a, a constant flow of data as series of electrical square waves. Uh, they are representing bits, zero or one. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we have a double oscillation for a one and a simple oscillation for the zero. And the square wave frequency is proportional to audio sampling frequency. Because uh, remember that uh, the, for one audio sample, we transmit two audio samples, uh, one for the channel E and the second one for the channel B. And each, uh, with uh, each sample of 24 bits, we have eight bits of metadata. So we have 64 bits for two samples, A, B. And uh, with a double oscillation uh, for, the, for the one, we have a, a ratio between the frequency of the sampling, uh, sampling rate and the frequency of the ASCBU signal, which is 128. So the frequency of the ASCBU signal is 128 times the sampling rate of the audio signal. Uh, as soon as the, the signal is uh, transmitted by the emitter, the receiver uh, can uh, uh, extract the PCM audio data, of course. It can also, also uh, verify the data integrity with the parity bit. And uh, after that, it can reconstruct the, the audio signal and, uh, for example, convert it to uh, the analog domain. Uh, I, with the ECBU, as I, as I said, we, we start uh, talking about synchronization. That means that the receiver clock needs to be synchronized with the signal, uh, that is with the, the emitter clock. They have uh, to be synchronized, both. And uh, when we talk about synchronization, we are talking about two things. The first is uh, frequency synchronization, that uh, we can call it also uh, syntonization. We want the, the two clocks to have the same weight. If the, so if the sender clock is at uh, 96 kilohertz, of course, we want the receiver clock to be at the same rate. And also, we need a phase synchronization. We need, uh, we need the two clocks to have the same rate and to have the same, uh, the same oscillation at the same time. We can call that uh, clapping in unison. Uh, as soon as we have instabilities in the synchronization, uh, we are creating jitter. As you can see on this graph, on the upper side, we, we have beautiful square waves that are from the, the emitter side. And in red, we have uh, what could uh, receive the receiver after a long cable or maybe a bad cable, a, a bad line, a bad transmission. Uh, so we had square waves and now we have uh, rounds. So we can have many errors in the uh, clock detection and uh, that creates jitter. Here with this graph, we have simulated the, 
the noise effect of, uh, of a jitter. That is a noise effect. Um, the jitter here is the oscillation of the clock, uh, random variations of the clock. So we, we have uh, simulated the three things, a uh, small jitter, model weight jitter, and a severe jitter. For the small jitter, uh, you can see the curve, which is the, the weight curve. We, you can barely see it uh, around uh, 7 or 800 hertz. You see that uh, with a small jitter, the noise created by it is uh, the, at uh, 160 dB below the level of the, the sine wave. So uh, for us, it's really, really not a problem. After that, with a moderate jitter that can be uh, a typical jitter that we can have uh, with long lines. Uh, it is the orange curve. Uh, even with a moderate jitter, you can see that the, the level of the noise is at uh, 140 dB below the, the level of the sine wave. Uh, again, it's really small because, uh, as you can know, with a with, uh, sample uh, resolution of 24 bits, we have 144 dB of uh, dynamic. So here we have below minus 140. Uh, we won't hear it. And uh, the purple curve, uh, a severe jitter, uh, is, it's really the worst case uh, that we can have. As you can see, we are below 120 dB, uh, below the, the level of the sine wave. Again, it's really small. Uh, as you know, for example, the NLA12X, which is a quite good amplifier, it, uh, it has 114 dB of dynamic. So with, with a noise at uh, 100, uh, minus 120 dB, we won't hear it uh, also. So the conclusion is that uh, the jitter effect, the noise effect of the of, uh, jitter is really low for the ACBU. Uh, since 1990s, the ICBU protocol has been extended to a multi-channel version, which is called uh, AS10, also called, uh, also called sorry, uh, multi-channel audio digital interface, which is uh, MADI. Uh, obviously, uh, I talk about it because we use MADI on, uh, on our processor for ELISA, and there are many mixing desks uh, that are still using uh, MADI. Uh, an AS10 frame, uh, we can remember I, AS3, uh, a frame of AS3 is composed of two subframes, one for channel A, one for channel B. In AS10, you have frames with uh, several subframes. So we can have many channels, uh, many channels in one frame. So it is a multi-channel uh, multi-channel uh, trans 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 uh, transport uh, method, but it is still a point-to-point -point connection. We transmit the signal from one emitter to one receiver. The pros and the cons for ASBU over an air transmission. The, the, the first clause is that transmission of the signal over long distances is done without audio degradation. And that means that as long as we can reconstruct the original signal, we, we have the same dynamics, the same bandwidth, we have the same signal as uh, we had at the emitter side. We have an immunity to ground loops because uh, we don't transport any more uh, audio frequency signal. And uh, electromagnetic induction, of course, uh, is an immunity. With ASCBU, we have two channels in one cable, one cable uh, which is better than uh, analog. And with MADI, we can uh, have up to 64 channels. For the cons, of course, we are still in point-to-point uh, -point wiring, and uh, we can no more do any star wiring uh, without dedicated uh, hardware. And of course, we can have some problem uh, because of the, some synchronization problem because of jitter. So now, uh, after ASCBU, we have uh, many uh, many multi-channel protocols based on uh, the Ethernet transport layer, like uh, AS50, uh, Ethersound, uh, WorkNet, or many others. I won't talk about all of them, of course. 
Uh, I just talk a little about Ethersound in its uh, 100 mega version because it has uh, almost the same capacities than MADI. It's, uh, it's capable of transporting up to 64 channels of 48 kilohertz, uh, 24 bits PCM audio data with a latency that's new, uh, latency of 125 microseconds. It's, uh, it's a small latency, but uh, it's bigger than MADI or AES. And uh, as you can see on this graph, uh, for, with Ethersound, we use uh, standard switches and uh, standard cables, Ethernet cables. So it's, uh, it's a fairly cheap uh, way of transporting audio. The pros and the cons. Uh, the pros, of course, is uh, multi-channel audio with cost-effective cabling over long distances because uh, Ethernet cabling or switches uh, is cheap and uh, it's uh, it's easy to, to transport audio uh, over long distances. The cons are uh, it's limited or impossible, depending on the protocol, to add other data than audio to the network. We we still want to add our control data with audio data. With uh, Ethersun, for example, it's uh, very limited, and uh, we are constrained uh, in our audio network arch architecture because uh, with Ethersun, for example, if you if we pass through a switch, we are uh, no more bidirectional after this switch. And now I will let uh, Etienne uh, talking about. Uh, audio of our IP network. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Guillaume, uh, for having gone through the, these formats. So now we are going to switch over to audio over IP, uh, which are uh, known like, uh, which are new protocols based on Ethernet network. And uh, among the different protocols that you probably know about, like there's RS67 since 2013, uh, uh, Ravenna since 2010 and Dante since 2006. Uh, so these formats will use higher functionalities uh, of uh, Ethernet networks in order to allow for more flexibility in the network audio architecture. Most probably using uh, standard network switches, at least that's the claim, and uh, the ability to support also control data on the same network. However, uh, there's, uh, there's something really new when we start to use like uh, IP uh, protocols is that the transmission of IP packets is no more synchronous, which means that they can leave like a, an emitter at a given time and be received at a receiver at, a, at, at some point, but it's difficult to guarantee that the, the time uh, at which they are emitted is regular and that the propagation time will be completely constant. So that means like there is a new requirement uh, that's added to the equation is the idea that we need to timestamp the messages that contain the audio data and timestamping means that we're going to put like inside the, the, the message uh, the information typically at which we want the receiver to be uh, playing the, the, the packet. And that brings an absolutely new requirement is that all devices need to be perfectly synced in time and they need to share a common wall clock. And what we mean by that is not just like share the clock with a second accuracy, but often it's within the range of tens or hundreds of nanoseconds, so very high precision, such that when we play the different packets on possibly several receivers, they are all perfectly in sync and in phase. So let's have a look on how this typically works, just to uh, put a little bit of an example on, uh, on how that, uh, that the, the, the packets are transmitted over the network. So typically what we are going to have is that we're going to have a talker here, that has uh, some audio data in. So uh, typically there for packet N, uh, the talker, uh, sorry, at, uh, on a block at a time instant N, we have a complete block of audio that's available for uh, distribution. So we'll typically create a new packet uh, that will comprise uh, the information, so a time information that timestamp 
that we are going to put inside the packet together with the audio, which will be typically uh, as we have for uh, since uh, our CBU encoded in PCM format. And we'll add some more information, which is more like uh, typical for, uh, for IP protocols uh, to form a packet. And this packet will be put into a queue, uh, the queue of the talker, and this talker will transmit the packet over the network at some point. And we don't know exactly when for sure. So the packet is there in the queue and we see that in the network we have packets that were corresponding to a block of audio N minus one and N minus two that are being transmitted and have not reached the listener yet. So what is critical is that both talker and listener have the same sense of time because what's going to happen is that the listener uh, will receive typically uh, packets in its own queue and it will need to be aware of the time at which they need to be played back. And that means like the listener and the talker need to have the same uh, timing information. So typically uh, what's going to happen is that the, the listener will notice that there is it's the right time to play the packet. It will extract the audio and start to form the audio channel. And what's happening then is that at, an, at uh, the next point of time, like uh, uh, the block N plus one is ready at the talker. So we'll form a packet, another packet that we put in the queue and so on and so forth. So uh, at a time later, like we, uh, we have the, the, the block N minus one that we extract and we play at the listener. OK, so what we see is that, as I said, timing and synchronization of the two are extremely important. And for that, there is one specific protocol that has been put in place, which is called, uh, which is for world clock synchronization that we that is called the precision time protocol that we often see uh, quoted as PTP, which will be uh, actually an exchange of time stamped messages between master of the world clock and a slave device, which will aim at estimating two things. It's the propagation time of messages through the network and which will allow to estimate the offset, the time offset, so how much off uh, typically the slave is to the master and the rate ratio to the master. So how, what's the speed, the clock speed difference between the slave and the master? And by this message exchange, so it's a rather simple thing that uh, we're going to do. So it's basically uh, exchanging four uh, time instance uh, for at the slave uh, for the slave. So out of these four time instance, the slaves is capable of adjusting for an offset and adjusting for the rate ratio. Everything's fine, but propagation time must be constant and symmetric. If that's not the case, which will typically be the case when we have standard network switches in the way, uh, we are going to have issues in synchronization. And that's even more true on a busy network. And why is that so? Is that PTP, the original protocol on which so PTP v1 typically on which most of the solution using some standard switches are based are considering that that a switch is a basic cable. So the, the, the messages go through the switch at a regular rate and will not be impacted by any additional traffic or any any anything uh, in the propagation. The thing is that it's already not true in a, in a very quiet network and that's even worse in a busy network. So we're going to have non-symmetric uh, propagation time and, and non-constant propagation time in this. And that will generate quite a bit of error in the synchronization process. So the pros of, uh, so the cons basically of uh, audio over IP is that we'll have wall clock synchronization issues because uh, standard network switches are not what we call time aware. So they cannot uh, give information about the time it took to go through the switches. And that's going to be a big, a big issue. 
This will introduce uncertainty in the propagation delay estimation and therefore will introduce delay, absolute delay and jitter in the wall clock uh, synchronization and the wall clock timing. So that means that different listeners that try to synchronize with one uh, typically talker device or master uh, for the for the wall clock will not have the exact same time information and we are going to have offset time offset between the different receivers that would want to play the same audio sample or the same audio block in general. Furthermore, packets can get lost. So that means like uh, we, are, we don't have a full guarantee uh, in a standard, let's say Ethernet, that all packets can go through. And typically it's going to be addressed by uh, quality of service uh, settings that will enable to give more priority to some messages than others. So typically uh, the uh, critical PTP messages are going to have the highest priority that's possible to set, that's 56. However, the priority level can go to 64, so they can get jammed, they can have uh, uh, issues uh, to to go through and uh, we can't guarantee that these messages will go through uh, exactly in time. And what's uh, possibly also problematic is that audio and more regular packets have a lower priority, so they have a high chance of going of going through, but any other traffic, and that means also the monitoring and control information as well, is best effort, meaning if the network is very busy and there's no time or no bandwidth available to have them through, they will just not go through. So that means you need to spend quite a lot of time and effort in uh, setting up the quality of service, have a good understanding and a good estimation of, let's say, the, the different uh, uh, the different the bandwidths that you need for the different uh, type of of data that you want to have through the network, such that you can have something more or less stable. So, if we take some examples of what can happen, is typically one of these: like you have a console that's sending data, so audio data at quite a high rate. Uh, through uh, through a switch, through a standard switch, and you have control information on the same network uh, that's going that's coming, for example, from that computer here. And what can happen is that the audio will get priority, so the audio will go through, but the data and the control information is not going through. So you're going to have only a small portion of that control information to go through. If we take a more complex example where we have audio again going through one switch, video that's coming from that computer and supposed to reach that second computer here through that one switch, we have also control information that goes there and probably from another device here. What's going to happen is that we can have like a a problem in bandwidth that, that would be quite typical where audio and video data having higher priority will go through but some packets may get lost that can happen and all the control information is just getting lost and that means like when we talk about lost for audio that means lost so the packet the audio packet number two is no, never going to reach the amplified controller so here we are talking about dropouts obviously. So the big issue we can have is that we can have packets that get lost uh, and that's primarily uh, over data with lower priority. Uh, so typically control data or it can be even uh, competing high priority packets in busy networks. Uh, so that means like audio or video if we have that on the same network and which will call for complex configuration of VLANs. And now we'll talk about uh, AVB and what uh, AVB is bringing to the table. And uh, for that, I'm going to uh, let the, the floor to Genio to talk, uh, to talk about it. Um, yep, thanks a lot, Etienne. So, yep, so we go to the next uh, chat bar. Um, why, why AVB? So like we have seen a bit uh, before, um, in general, Ethernet was never done to be uh, a real-time transport, so um, it was a communication network 
And uh, all, let's say, the standardization of it was done in the IEEE organization, more or less in the, the special group that's uh, called uh, IEEE 802.1. And um, with uh, all the involvement, uh, let's say starting with uh, Skype, uh, voice over IP, etc., the consortium, uh, um, let's say, sit together and said, okay, every solution that's uh, uh, getting from other companies, let's say, trying to deal around somehow with um, the issues that uh, Ethernet itself has, uh, that it's simply not uh, capable of uh, transporting real time. That means uh, then uh, uh, they said, OK, let's uh, work on some uh, standards on uh, getting the real time layer done for AVB and um, uh, making all the technical mechanisms uh, in place. And uh, this was uh, actually done by uh, plenty of uh, engineers sitting together and uh, working on um, technical solutions. And uh, this came up in the ABB uh, technology. So maybe you can go to the next slide. So, and um, let's say, yes, ABB is a technology. Uh, it means it's, a, um, it's very wide open. So it can be uh, not only for um, um, audio, it's uh, also used for uh, automotive. So it's used in cars, it's used in uh, industrial uh, applications. And uh, so it's a wide, wide set. And um, to make the mechanisms work, um, there was the Avenue Alliance uh, founded where manufacturers can uh, uh, come together and uh, let's say define uh, certification processes, uh, define how let's say for certain industries uh, things uh, can be put together. And as a further initiative, you can see this a bit like um, a profile um, was then on top uh, set uh, um, the Milan initiative uh, also made uh, uh, under the Avenue umbrella where um, um, this is an organization that allows that uh, actually competitors uh, can work together under an antitrust environment uh, to solve uh, technological issues and um, there then we said okay uh, to to be able to uh, to get products from manufacturer a to work with manufacturer b uh, where everyone developed the implementation by himself um, we, we need to define uh, really clear rules how to do this and uh, this uh, was uh, done uh, under the Milan label and uh, therefore we also created uh, a certification that ensures that uh, this uh, products uh, working together. So let's go a bit into the ABB terminology. So I have seen there was already uh, before a few questions. Um, so first is the ABB stream. So what is the ABB stream? It's more or less a flow of a data uh, packets transmitted through the network from uh, one talker that um, could be, for example, P1, and then uh, um, distributed to more listeners, uh, one or more listeners, and that's, for example, the, the amplifiers, uh, where we can see LA12X, you can have uh, uh, several hundreds of LA12X and they are just connected to one uh, talker stream. And uh, a stream actually is independent from what is the data content. So it could be either audio, it could be video, it could be something that drives the machine and it contains also clock informations. Um, an AVB uh, talker then is, let, uh, let's say, the device that sends out an uh, AVB stream to the network. And then an AVB listener is a device like an amplifier, for example, that receives uh, streams, AVB streams from the network and uh, takes them and then uh, play them out, convert them to analog signals, uh, to loudspeakers, etc. 
And then an AVB bridge, that's the term in um, AVB uh, language uh, for an Ethernet switch that is able to, um, to handle AVB, um, AVB network traffic and uh, is uh, time aware. And um, it's important as this is a relatively complex technique uh, that it's an avenue certified switch only with this stringent uh, certification we are sure uh, that it really uh, works properly under the all uh, circumstances. And then the AVB domain, more or less, that's the network domain uh, uh, where uh, AVB devices uh, um, interconnect together and the streams can flow from Torga to any listener, vice versa. And um, then an AVB controller is, uh, is an entity on the network that uh, configures uh, and connects the Torga's listeners. Um, it's Kind, for example, the, our L Acoustics Network Manager is also in parallel an AVB controller so that uh, manage that uh, devices uh, like uh, P1 and LA12X can uh, connect. So um, the AVB um, technology, now that's, um, I already talked a little bit uh, uh, before, so first it's uh, it's a precise uh, timing, uh, it's called uh, there um, the GPTP and it's more or less an uh, evolution of the, the PTPT uh, uh, version 2 and it's offering uh, really a very precise and accurate uh, timing. Um, then uh, Another very important point is the bandwidth reservation and uh, this is uh, uh, really only available on the AVB technology. That means a device that connects reserves a bandwidth for it and whatever happens when there are other devices uh, are connecting to the network or someone decides to stream uh, uh, um, a video or to stream download a big uh, DVD uh, content. Uh, the device that reserved the bandwidth still have it under any circumstances. Um, then uh, the third building block is the scheduling. That's a credit-based uh, uh, shaver that uh, um, more or less uh, balances the traffic on the network. So, because normally you can have uh, very large peaks on the network, uh, uh, then there are uh, less traffic, but uh, when everyone wants to send at the same time, um, yeah, it's like a traffic jam on the, the outer route. So you need to have a credit-based shaper that uh, um, uh, balance this out over the network. So to give a bit an uh, example about the presentation time, so um, we have uh, yes uh, the device that uh, uh, plays it out on the on the left side. Um, he knows the the time on the network uh, that I have to transpose everything. For example, is two millisecond. It can be also lower on an AVB network, but uh, the default value is two milliseconds. So it uh, uh, plays it, gives the time um, that the uh, targers on the right side uh, know I have to play this with this timestamp plus uh, two milliseconds and it distributes through the network and everyone at the same time is uh, exactly playing out uh, the sample. And uh, to be able to do this, of course, uh, there is a wall clock synchronization required because uh, uh, originally on the Ethernet, uh, there is no time at itself. So first of all, you need to be sure that uh, when you establish a uh, uh, um, audio network that each device on the network having its uh, having exactly the same clock. And uh, therefore, at the beginning, uh, all devices that connect together uh, select the grandmaster. So that is uh, the clock source. Normally, that's um, uh, most time the, the ABV bridges that uh, will be elected. And uh, then um, they align the timings uh, of the wall clock um, on all the other devices that are connected. 
So, and uh, I like now to hand over to Etienne. Yeah, thank you, Guignot. Uh, so, uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, back at other methods of uh, sync of wall clock synchronization because uh, we are going to be able to, be to compare like the performance in uh, different type of networks. And uh, for that, like we'll do a little bit of recap of what happens in a newer version of PTP format, which is called PTP V2. Uh, which already requires some specific uh, and time aware switches. PTP V2 is typically used in a 67 or a Ravenna, although it's not an absolute uh, requirement uh, to, to have them inside. And by default, if you don't use uh, switches that are time aware, so uh, kind of special switches already, uh, it will use like a more legacy uh, PTP standard where uh, basically network switches are considered as cables. So what happens in PTP v2 is that like uh, uh, instead of having the switches to be like completely uh, passive devices, the switches will be able to add information into the messages, into the PTP messages to, ex to tell how long it took to go through the switch entirely. And there are two mechanisms that can be used, uh, one which is called um, boundary clock, where the, basically, the switch will act as a local master clock, so it will synchronize itself with the original master PTP clock, and then will react as a new master to, uh, for follow-up devices along the network. The other mechanism is called transparent clock and is slightly different. In that case, the switch is not acting as a local master, but will adjust uh, the PTP messages to tell how long it took uh, to go through the switch. So that like in the estimation of the propagation time, uh, it's accounted for. In such uh, mechanisms, actually most of what remains to be measured is the transmission through the cables and transmission through the cables is something that's quite deterministic. Although there are still some small inaccuracies and that's what we are going to see. And typically what happens like in PTP v2 uh, in both of the modes is that there might be some error accumulation. So its uh, synchronization uh, process is never absolutely perfect. So you're going to introduce errors. And as you use synchronization of a previous device uh, later down the chain to uh, create the timing information because even in a transparent clock like you would use the synchronized clock of the switch to precise the time it took to go through the network you're going to have error accumulation so error will build up and will get more and more amplified as you go through the network in GPTP, so if you see this original signal like you're adding error and you're adding in more errors down the chain in GPTP, it's a bit different because we are not like directly resynchronizing uh, the devices against the master in the way we communicate messages down the chain. And this allows to build uh, maybe some small error at some point, but uh, this error is not going to be transmitted exactly the same through the network. So it uses a mechanism of transparent clocks. It's quite similar to that where it will like adjust timing in the messages or add some specific timing information uh, through, um, uh, in, uh, sorry, to the messages. But it will also propagate uh, the rate ratio, which is the difference in clock speed between the grandmaster and uh, in a unit to unit to the, to the neighbors. And that is a mechanism that allows to minimize the error propagation uh, through the different uh, devices on the network. The overall algorithm is fairly complex, so we're not going to enter into the details, but that's what's to be remembered is that there is very minimized error propagation with GPTP. In order to uh, validate a bit that, like uh, we're going to uh, actually uh, report on a test. So it's not a test that we've done ourselves, but it's done by one of the partners of the Avenue Alliance, which is called Ixia, which is typically a test lab for, uh, for uh, network devices. Uh, 
And this test is quite a stress test uh, of, uh, of a network. So what we are seeing here is that we have six switches, one after the other, that are 100% loaded. And the test signal here is video, but it would work exactly the same with audio. Because as we said, as Genio said, like especially the AVB part uh, has been made for time sensitive data in general, which can be audio, video, machinery, whatever we want. So here it's video. Each stream of video is basically uh, representing 5% of the network load. And what we see is that each, each switch is saturated by having like 10% of video and 90% of background information here. An additional 10% of video and therefore only 80% of background and so on and so forth. And at the last switch, we're adding as well 10% uh, of audio as voice over IP, uh, which means that towards the listener, we overly saturated. So it's really a stress test. It's not a Bayesian network that you would uh, that you would use, but still it's a good way to test like uh, how the different protocols will deal uh, with uh, timing and, uh, and, and timing accuracy. And what's really interesting to see is that when we look uh, at the timing accuracy, so they had the ability to check for timing information, so wall clock synchronization precision for each of the devices down the chain. So for PTP, the regular PTP with non-time aware switches, obviously we can't uh, check at different switches because switches are not time aware and therefore not synchronized whatsoever. However, what we can do is uh, uh, we can check at the very end to see what's the timing, uh, the time difference. And what we see is that on a loaded network like that, so we are obviously at a stress test level, uh, it's extremely high. So we have a, a error of 2.5 milliseconds, which is basically like uh, uh, 10,000 times what we would want to have. What's also important to see is that uh, when they were, they did also that test with a non-stressed network where they had only like uh, only a very bit of traffic on the network and they already have like 10 microseconds of error, which is again like a hundred. So now it's more a hundred times higher than what we want, but still it's very significant. When we look at PTPv2 with the two mechanisms, so the boundary clocks mechanism where uh, each uh, switch will act as a local master for the devices down the chain, we see this big error accumulation because the first switch is nicely synchronized, so it has a very low error in the range that we're interested in, and the, high, uh, the last switch is completely uh, out of uh, the range, so it's 4.5 microseconds. There's been a big buildup of error over there. When we use the transparent clock mechanism, we see that already at the first switch, we are fairly high in the, uh, in the amount of inaccuracy. So we are at one, uh, 1,000 nanosecond or one microsecond of inaccuracy. And we have 4,000 nano nanoseconds of inaccuracy at the last switch. However, what we see is that with AVB, we remain in very safe ground. So we are well below the 100 nanoseconds that we wanted to have. What's important to see in those graphs or to explain is that these are not just like peak errors that would happen once in a while. It's very much constant. So it's either like a kind of RMS error, which is uh, giving that type of value for the switches. And that's the case primarily for PTP v2. But for PTP, the end to end, it's, complete, it's fairly constant. So we are reaching a given timing, an error, and then it's not moving so much. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to our idea of the level of accuracy we want to have, just to give a bit of numbers and feeling of uh, what we get when we get that type of accuracy. So from the test that we got, like we saw that uh, with AVB and with GPTP, we get an accuracy in the range of plus minus 0.1 microseconds, so 100 nanoseconds. It corresponds to about like a hundredth of a sample at 96 kilohertz. 
or uh, plus minus 0.2% phase shift at 20 kilohertz. So when we reach that type of accuracy, we can say we are completely in sync and the error that's remaining becomes almost insignificant. Okay, uh, now I'm going to give the, the mic over to Genio again. Um, thanks, Etienne. Uh, Etienne. So <clears throat> the next is uh, the bandwidth uh, reservation, what is uh, the another big uh, building block. And um, the important thing is that when, um, when um, let's say, a device um, tries to connect to the network, the first thing is he is uh, check uh, which listeners are interested into it. And um, then it's uh, checking what is the bandwidth that is uh, av available. So, and this is uh, even before it uh, connects. And then when it sees that there is uh, the bandwidth uh, available, um, it uh, uh, reserves it and is able to transfer the stream. And this uh, gives, I would say, a big advantage uh, uh, compared to other technologies. Um, that means uh, in any case, you have this uh, bandwidth um, to stream and uh, whatever happens on the network, you will not be affected uh, uh, by it. So, and um, here we can uh, see um, it's by the IEEE standard defined that um, the bandwidth uh, reservation uh, can be um, at uh, up to 75% uh, of the, the, the whole network, let's say on a, on a gigabit, but it's important um, that um, it does not uh, need to have this uh, 75 percent so it can be also lower depending if uh, for example you need to have additional uh, much more network traffic but uh, for example on a gigabit network uh, already 25 percent for other protocols like a control a web uh, net uh, media network uh, it's uh, actually uh, most time uh, uh, sufficient uh, for it and um, it's also important um, like I said uh, uh, already a bit before um, this 75% uh, um, are not always so uh, for example when you just uh, transport um, I don't know with uh, two to eight channels over a gigabit network you will never reach this 75% uh, of the bandwidth uh, reservation so there is a uh, plenty enough uh, for other traffic um, available. Then the third building block, uh, that's the scheduling, uh, that's the credit based uh, shaver. And um, yes, so um, the idea behind it is uh, more or less uh, that uh, you you have, um, let's say, slopes in the traffic uh, where you have uh, um, much, much more requirements and the others uh, where you have uh, less. And that's uh, very often it happens that, uh, for example, bridges uh, collects the traffic, um, um, uh, stores it a little bit. Uh, this is why switches also introduce uh, introduces uh, latencies and then um, they, they, they throw out, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, um, uh, packets at the same time and uh, with the credit based chamber we are able uh, on AVB to smooth this out. So and uh, here for example we see it uh, so um, the, um, the prior test AVB traffic uh, is ahead of the legacy data and um, so um, this gives uh, kind of this uh, audio, audio traffic rate that you see on the left side and then with the traffic shaper we can uh, distribute this uh, so that we get more or less uh, a smoothed out uh, line rate uh, traffic over time and this is also um, a very important uh, functionality um, so to guarantee the delivery and uh, the time of uh, delivery so and uh, i want to hand over back uh, to etienne for the next yeah thank you genio
Uh, so yes, so I'll just uh, end over to recap a bit also on uh, additional tests that was done by uh, our partners at uh, Ixia. Uh, so it's still like the same type of test that they have done, but now they were looking uh, for uh, the amount of packets that would get lost and the time it took for packets, time critical packets. So in that case, again, that was video to reach the listener. And what's really interesting to see is that uh, with AVB, they tested with one gigabit or 10 gigabit network, and there was absolutely no loss, although that was an overly saturated network. However, with legacy uh, protocols using quality of service, they could get 5% of loss on a one gigabit network. So for video, this would result in uh, typically in lower quality in images, so not as uh, sharp pictures and maybe uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of noise in the picture, but for audio, you can imagine it's absolutely not acceptable because that would mean dropouts. And uh, the other important thing is the maximum latency per stream is that with AVB on this overly loaded network, like uh, it was uh, only 350 microseconds. And you can remember that what we are recommending and what we are using as a presentation time and as a additional day, a latency for presentation time is two milliseconds. So this is quite conservative um, as even in that uh, completely stress test. Uh, however, with legacy QoS, it could be above or around 50 milliseconds. So that means we are much, it was much longer, it was much after this uh, presentation time that the packets would arrive. So not only were we losing packets along the way, but also uh, they were arriving too late, which would again, result in dropouts. So that's typically and absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and I'm going to give Genio the word again. Okay, so um, finally we go now to the control layer that's uh, in AVB uh, uh, called uh, AFTEC. Uh, it's more or less it came from audio video discovery, enumeration, connection management, and control. A very long word for uh, something that uh, more or less uh, is um, the tool that allows you to make the connections in a in a, a standardized uh, way. So, and um, this uh, moves us further to to Milan. So, um, why why do we need it, uh, Milan? So, like I explained a little bit uh, uh, before, um, IEEE standards and uh, also the IEEE AVB standards. Um, they are made for a very wide, wide industry. So it gives a lot of possibility to do different things. And uh, um, it, for example, reminds a little bit like on the early days of uh, uh, um, wireless uh, networking interfaces. So when you had an interface from D-Link, for example, and you went to a hotel and they had one from Netgear, then uh, most time uh, you was not able to connect to it because both was using the IEEE standards, but they have interpreted it in uh, different ways. And uh, so this, um, I would say, uh, um, happened very often until the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, was uh, created and uh, then agreed on for this uh, certain um, use case uh, on, on the setups. And um, this is um, where we then came up on, um, let's say, a few years ago um, with, the, with the founding of the Milan Group in uh, AVB. So, and um, there, more or less, we built the application layer on top of the AVB to ensure that uh, the endpoints, uh, what are the devices like P1 or from our competitors, can work properly together and, let's say, speak exactly the same language and not uh, one is uh, speaking uh, American and the other one is uh, French and uh, they cannot connect. And um, so, 
This uh, was made uh, from industry leaders uh, um, for the industry. So, and this uh, the Pro Audio AVB network uh, standard. So, um, um, Milan is uh, basically an, uh, um, an, an open solution. All the standards are, are published uh, by Avenue, so you can implement them even without being an, uh, a member. And uh, it specifies uh, the audio stream formats, um, also the network redundancy solution that it's clear that Every manufacturer is using exactly the same way of it, uh, the media clocking structures, and uh, um, that it's working very well with, um, with the Avenue certified uh, switches. So, and uh, when we take a look on the audio stream format, so there are plenty of different stream formats uh, specified in uh, in um, the AVB IEEE standard, uh, even already for audio. So um, we have chosen on the Milan Group that we take the so-called uh, AAF uh, uh, audio format uh, for talkers and listeners to speak the same language and uh, uh, to be able to exchange uh, audio. Mostly the reason was it's less uh, complex to implement it uh, uh, on uh, intensive uh, network. And it supports uh, 48 uh, kilohertz up to eight uh, channels. And this is mandatory. So let's say uh, uh, that's the, the, the minimum agreement every Milan device needs to implement. And then on top of that, it can uh, uh, add uh, 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz. Um, and also other uh, higher channel count uh, formats. Um, but at least uh, uh, this is the minimum requirement for, for a device to guarantee audio interoperability. Then the other part is uh, the seamless uh, redundancy, and this is implemented as a, a duplicate uh, network infrastructure. So more or less it has uh, two independent networks and uh, um, there was also a bit of discussion, uh, okay, why, uh, for example, make it completely uh, independent, uh, but uh, at the end, when in pro audio you do this uh, on a professional uh, way, uh, you need to duplicate everything because, uh, yeah, it makes no sense to have a, um, a doubly, um, uh, redundant infrastructure just with one switch uh, because uh, then most time uh, this switch will, will, will fail more or less. Um, yep, and then we have the, the media clock like um, shown before by, by Etienne and Guillaume. Of course, each uh, digital audio needs to have some kind of, a, of a clocking information. It's not enough just to transfer the, the time of it. Um, we also need to, to know what uh, is the audio clock to be able to stream phase aligned uh, audios over a line source uh, array. And uh, the simplest way uh, is, of course, that uh, um, you all only synchronize to the to the media stream to the where also your audio is in, um, and then extract it. But of course, um, there can be scenarios um, where this is not uh, the best solution. So, um, for example, if you have uh, more than one talker, so you need to somehow synchronize them together to have the same audio clock and uh, face alignment and um, that the listener can receive this from uh, two, um, two different talkers and uh, play them out. And so this is why we then have also um, added the CIF uh, media clock stream that uh, can be used uh, to it. And um, also what is uh, um, possible within an AVB network is that you have uh, more than one clock domain. So it's not uh, required that all devices running on uh, 96 kilohertz. So when you have uh, something running independent on the same infrastructure, um, you can let them run on another clock domain uh, if you want, um, want to do this. 
So to conclude this part, um, the benefits of Milans are the true plug and play um, network setup amongst different manufacturer. Um, the good, uh, very good uh, uh, quality. So you will not have dropouts uh, or degradation of the media. Um, however, the traffic on the network will be. Um, we have the, redund uh, the enhanced uh, redundancy scheme and uh, control and audio seamless uh, on the cable without uh, conflict and this is uh, a very great thing and on top of that of course um, you do not need to be an IT expert um, to set these things up and this was uh, very important uh, from our side um, so um, that we say okay we want to to make concerts we want to play audio but at the end nobody of us uh, wants to make uh, uh, scratch his head about uh, how do i need to set up this uh, network environment uh, what is the qs oh no i need to do this vlan uh, that's uh, that things you do not need with uh, milan and uh, yep, then I'd like to hand over back again to Etienne to give you a little bit uh, more info about L Acoustics and uh, Milan World. Okay, thank you, Genio. Uh, okay. So yeah, uh, I'll go back to, to this part where we're going to show a little bit like uh, what's the portfolio of products that we have now that are Milan certified or working in a, in a Milan environment and uh, how they can be used uh, together. So uh, all the range of products that we have now uh, that are Milan uh, compatible or Milan certified are amplified controllers. So we have three of them, one upcoming and two uh, well uh, known like LA4X and LA12X and the upcoming is LA2XI that we announced at the AAC uh, and that's uh, already uh, Milan certified. Uh, we have uh, processors like uh, P1 and we have a switch now, LS10. So if we look into uh, the different capabilities of Milan, so we have uh, typically a talker that's capable of uh, transmitting audio information through the network. And uh, our only talker so far is uh, P1, which will deliver two output streams. So that's uh, I'm saying upcoming because that's coming with the next release uh, of uh, Network Manager and firmware that's just about to be, uh, to be av available. Uh, which will be able to have each uh, eight channels in either AAF, which is the preferred format uh, for Milan, or legacy AM824, uh, which is uh, still available for compatibility with uh, other devices. Uh, it can work at 48 or 96 kilohertz and will have the default network latency of two milliseconds uh, that we're recommending uh, in uh, Milan just to uh, to make sure in simple rules that you will never have like uh, packets that arrive too late. And it can also provide one CRF stream which can be used for uh, media clock synchronization as we'll see uh, later in the demo. We also have listeners, uh, so our listeners are actually as well have new and Milan certified, so P1 can be a listener as well. It can have like one input stream or even two actually in the case of P1. Uh, uh, the other listeners are LA2XI, LA12X and LA4X obviously, which are uh, our amplified controllers that are supporting, the, supporting Milan. Uh, we can have up to eight channels uh, per stream, as we know, and uh, the same like uh, AAF and AM824 uh, format. So typically for listeners, like we can have incoming streams at 48 or 96 kilohertz, that will be typically up sample to 96 kilohertz when they come at 48 kilohertz, because our DSP all run uh, at, uh, at 96 kilohertz. And we can have media clock uh, support. So the media clock support for the amplified controllers will be solely the input stream uh, on which uh, they are connected, which is uh, enough actually. And in P1, it will be user selectable between internal audio stream or CRF stream in order to resynchronize the media clocks of several P1s that would play audio through the network. As bridges, which are then only Avenue certified, as we said, like Milan doesn't have a specific uh, certification for uh, 
for bridges, like the Avenue certification is enough uh, to build a Milan compatible network. Uh, we have actually all of our devices because they all incorporate like a small Ethernet switch, which has a basis like would have only two ports for amplified controllers and P1 and could have 10 ports as our LS10. They are all AVB capable at Ethernet switch and uh, they can uh, have, uh, they can be in uh, AVB networks of more than one talker and one listener typically. They will also support RSTP uh, to protect again network loops or enable as well some kind of uh, hardware redundancy in the case of creating a loop, which would be additional redundancy to the preferred redundancy scheme of Milan. So our switch uh, LS10 uh, actually uh, is, uh, is a new addition to a line. So it has a, a setup time of five seconds uh, from Poryang to full service, which is uh, quite interesting compared to other options. Uh, it's rugged, it has passive cooling, and it's a native AVB bridge, which means you don't need any additional license to make it work. What's important is that it's not designed to be used with Dante or QLAN or other protocols that would require typically uh, to set quality of service. We try to make it as simple as possible such that it's truly plug and play and serves best uh, our application. So what's important to discuss is the network modes. So we would have two network modes on P1, LA2XI and LA12X. So there is no change for LA4X and LA8, which would use normal mode because they don't support uh, actually the redundancy. So the normal mode is that typically uh, you would have, so it's the mode most probably you know already, which is the case where you would have one listener and one bridge. So we could connect like uh, the, uh, the amplifier to a network with both ports, uh, but that means that only one port like would listen uh, to the incoming FVB stream and the second one would typically act as a bridge uh, to a network. When we switch into the redundant mode, uh, that means both ports uh, will be actually connected to different networks. So one will act, will uh, be connected to a primary network that's typically uh, in color code black uh, in our case. And the second port will be connected to a secondary network that's color code red most often. And in that case, uh, actually the any amplified controller that's connected in that mode uh, will actually not act as a bridge any longer. That's very important to remember. That means that in red redundancy mode, units cannot be daisy chained and the redundancy applies to AVB only. So it's very uh, straightforward the way it works is that typically uh, the audio packets uh, with similar timestamps will arrive uh, at both endpoints in the best case, but the DSP will only analyze one of them. And it doesn't matter whether it's primary or secondary, it will take one of these and play it back. So that means that if you lose one on the other network, there will be zero dropouts because it will be almost as if for the DSP, both networks would be connected. So that's a very interesting point is that this redundancy is completely uh, is diversity like typically as we call it and it will be very uh, very straightforward and without any audible consequence and what's important to understand is that we can still have uh, the classical fallback to analog or ISOBU in addition so we can end up with a very high level of redundancy and reliability. One thing to consider as there uh, as well is that there should be only one network manager instance with one single network connection, which would be typically on the primary network. And that network manager could be moved over to secondary network when preferable or necessary. And typically uh, both networks will have uh, slightly different IP ranges. So you'll need to adjust the IP range on the computer on which of the computer on which you have the, the network manager instance. So in the end, what we've built, and that's uh, very important, that was our goal, uh, is one network with three functionalities. 
the first functionality that you already know about uh, in all, basically most of L acoustic system will be uh, the ability to uh, control and monitor L acoustics units uh, using the so-called LNet protocol. The second protocol, that's the control protocol of AVB, which is AVDEC to be able to discover, monitor, and connect different streams on the network. And the third one, which is the one we were interested with uh, to, start, to start with, is the audio distribution using AVB audio stream. And all of this can work on the same network with our glitches. And thanks to all the good uh, mechanisms of AVB, the audio is not going to disturb the control information, so we have very high reliability on the delivery of the audio, as well as on the delivery of the control information using one single network. Two physical if we want the redundancy, but it's one physical network uh, in the end. So uh, now I'm going to uh, to give the word to uh, Guillaume to uh, go through usages and uh, application examples, and we'll end up with a small demo from Scott. Thank you, Etienne. So uh, here is now the first application example, which is a simple one. We have a mixing desk, a P1, and a computer with a network manager at the input of the of the of the LS10. Uh, you can see we have uh, five uh, stacks of three amplifiers. Uh, each stack is connected to one port of the, the, the LS10, and uh, the amplifiers are daisy chained by three. It's a it's a simple uh, way of uh, using AVB. Uh, we 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 could also have uh, many more amplifiers, uh, daisy chain amplifiers. And uh, as you can see, if you already control your amplifiers with a network manager, your AVB network is already done. You just have to insert an, uh, an FNU certified switch or less uh, than uh, in the way of uh, transmitting the signal. Uh, if, if you need a larger, uh, larger installation, that means if you need more amplifiers, and we, you cannot uh, daisy chain uh, uh, enough amplifiers, you need to to, to use the uh, LRX2 AVB, which is, as Etienne said, uh, an LRX2 with uh, two LS10 uh, inside. Uh, you, you can also see the the color code uh, for the primary network, which is black, and the secondary network, uh, which is uh, red, and um, and uh, we uh, yes, also we, we have uh, we we you have two SFP free ports uh, for the fiber optics, for example. Uh, it, it can help you to to connect an electric to FB over long distances or mm -hmm. to uh, to get rid of uh, different power supplies uh, problems. Uh, the rear view of uh, electric to FB. As it is, as it is sold now, uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, each port of each LS12X on uh, one port of an LS10. Uh, you have the three black cables for the primary network and the three red ones for the secondary networks. Uh, we have six cables, uh, high-end Ethernet cables, uh, CAT7, uh, and uh, the three Ethercon connectors, of course. Uh, as we are in the pro audio industry. Uh, and here is a typical uh, uh, usage of the dry redundancy. Uh, at the front of us, we, we have a mixing desk, a P1, and two LS10. So uh, you can uh, also connect your network manager on the first LS10 at the front of us. You can see that uh, we have a first connection between the LS10 and the first LRX2 AVB that can be fiber optic uh, if it's uh, for a long distance. And uh, after that, uh, you can connect many more LRX2 AVB uh, with a star wiring uh, or a daisy chain wiring, uh, not a problem. Uh, of course, we have restriction in number of units in a daisy chain topology. Uh, 
Uh, that is for uh, for uh, on the one gigabit network, which is wha what we use now with uh, all our amplifiers. Uh, the only one that is uh, 100 megabits is is L8, and it it is not AVB, of course. Uh, you should not use more than 12 units uh, in the daisy chain topology. Otherwise, you can have 10 direct to AVB after a P1. And uh, if you if you respect those conditions, you you ensure uh, guaranteed delivery and uh, that you 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 have your uh, two millisecond uh, latency. Uh, and uh, to conclude the examples here, you, it is to show you that we can uh, we can mix uh, AVB compatible or non AVB compatible on the same network. You can see here that uh, we have uh, two uh, LFRX, for example, connected to an LS10 uh, with a mixing desk and a network manager. And we have, that is our AVB domain, and we, are, we have uh, another switch which is not AVB capable. And we have connected two L8 uh, on this switch. Uh, of course, uh, the AVB uh, the L8 are not AVB compatible, but in this case, with the network manager, we can control uh, LFOX and L8 uh, with the same instance of network manager. Uh, even if uh, it's not AVB compatible, we can uh, we can mix control data, Ethernet data, standard Ethernet data, and AVB uh, audio data. And uh, now I think uh, we are going to have a demonstration uh, of uh, how to use a uh, media clock uh, when we have multiple talkers on the same network. Up. Thank you. Okay. Gio, let me, uh, let me just welcome. share my screen here. Yeah. Give me yeah. one second, guys. Not a problem. Yeah, no problem here. Great. Uh, one second. There, great. Okay, that should be set. One second. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Screen two. How about that? Oh. You got me now? Yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. Okay. Can go. Excellent, guys. So I just have with me an instance of LA Network Manager. This is 3.1, which we'll be releasing shortly. Um, I've brought with me from the office a pair of P1. Uh, this is P1 IP address 150. This is P1 IP address 151. And I also have at my home office here an LA4X IP address 152. So there's a couple of things we've been talking about over the last uh, hour and a half or so. Um, and I just wanted to demonstrate to you guys how this all works. So first off in Network Manager, we can select the input mode. Um, and in this, we can see that the P1 actually now has the choice of two potential input streams. So it can connect itself or it can listen to two different AVB talkers on the network. So you can imagine that being listening to a, a mixing console, maybe another P1 um, or, or any other AVB Milan capable device. Um, on the P1 here I've labeled matrix, we also have the choice of output selection and I can give it a name. So in this case, I've actually named this one P1 matrix. Um, we can choose the two output streams and I can call it uh, different things like, uh, let's call this one main mains um, and we could give the second stream a different name like uh, delays for whatever reason i want to do this um, and we even can choose what avb outputs from the dsp are routed to what stream channels in this particular stream and by default the p1 is using uh, the aaf pcm 32 96 kilohertz eight channel stream but you could change that and why we might want to do that is to conserve network bandwidth. If ultimately to the mains, we're only sending four channels of audio, we could choose to change that to a four channel stream so we don't use all that bandwidth. Uh, if you recall, we talked about the fact that AVB automatically reserves and segregates the bandwidth on every bridge that it's connected through. And if we only need to pass two or four channels of audio, that'll save some bandwidth in the long run. Okay, second thing we could do here uh, is, is change the clock rate. For whatever reason, um, uh, AVB Milan, uh, or Milan specifies that we are 48 
kilohertz in eight channels by default that everyone can accept that. Um, but optionally, we can do higher sample rates. Uh, maybe we need to send a, a lower sample rate to a device for whatever reason. The P1 is capable of doing that, of sending out a 96 kilohertz and then also downsampling at 48 for, for other devices on those two streams if needed. Um, this P1 matrix, so this is our system matrix at our giant festival that has one LA4X amplifier, of course. Um, what do we have here on the input mode selection? Well, we could choose our source. So in other words, uh, we could take the mixer and we could choose the stream that's dedicated for the system. Um, and when I do that, you see the first thing that's happened is it says that the stream is connected at 96 kilohertz, four channels, and it's locked. But right now, this P1 is on its internal clock, and what we need to think about is matching media clocks between devices. And there's a couple ways we could do that. Let me just disconnect from this real quick. So we could choose an AVB input stream as our media clock source, the internal clock, or a CRF stream. And what we can do here is determine that our media clock is going to be coming from the CRF, which happens to be this mixer. So now our system matrix P1 is slaving its media clock to the mixing council, for example. And this works both ways. So I could choose to clock the entire sound system off of the matrix, um, or maybe that's not a good choice. Let's do this internal. And let's say the other way around. What we want to do is have our guest mixer console slave itself from the house system. And why would we want to do that? Well, we'd want to do that really simply because when they turn off their mixing desk at the end of the night, we don't lose audio on the entire system. So that's how we do that there. Back to my P1. Um, I might want to grab my system right here. We are locked. There's my connection, four channels. It's all good to go. Um, we can see that uh, the stream mapping has come in stream 1.1, 1.2.3.4. That means my AVB inputs on my P1 are going to be coming one through four from this stream that's connected. That's really easy to do. And we could set up our P1 as we wanted. We could set up all of our groups like we've talked about over the last week and a half. And last and not least, we can connect our LA4X here. So we have some online streams. So this LA4X sees all available online streams, and it sees that they're all from the same grandmaster. So what this means now is these two P1s and this LA4X are all within the same AVB domain. So everything connected between them is an AVB compatible device. So there's no uh, non-AVB switches in the middle. And I could, for instance, choose to connect this LA4X to the P1 called Matrix with the stream called One Mains. And just as quick as that, I see that I'm connected right now with an AAF PCM32 uh, format, 96 kilohertz, four channels, and this is the stream mapping at this particular device. So AVB channel 1, 2, 3, 4 is routed to input on the amp A, B, C, and D, and you guys could change that if you'd like. Um, we can even unpatch one if we don't need it at this particular amp just to make it less confusing for ourselves, um, and that's just simply deleting out the patching, and it's all good to go. So all of the L acoustics devices, the P1, uh, the LA12X, the LA4X, and obviously the upcoming LA2XI can be managed with an LA network manager. But if you're using a non-AVB um, device, um, there's an open source controller called Hive you can use as well. And within Hive, you get a routing of all the different listeners and all the different talkers. And you can route, for instance, the main I can see is sent to the, pardon me, where's my LA4X? There it is. Um, I can unpatch and repatch the same stream with Hive. So this is how I might connect other Milan capable devices uh, between if, uh, if needed as well. So that's how to do it. Um, if you guys have more questions on how this works, please, uh, and you don't happen to have a two P1s and an LA4X sitting on your desk, please don't hesitate to reach out to your local application engineer. Um, I'm sure they'd be more than willing to uh, help answer any questions you might have. Um, Etienne, is it back to you or is it back to Guillaume? I think it's back to the end. Back to the that end. was the end of the presentation. Fantastic. We are through. So uh, yeah, that was a, a quite extensive presentation, but uh, I think that's what we wanted to give uh, as an outcome also to explain really why on the low level, low technological level, we've chosen to go for that solution. Uh, I hope you could uh, you could get like uh, the underlying like uh, 
uh, reasons for which we decided to go for it and we think it's a really good solution that's uh, um, that's future proof and uh, that's uh, forward thinking and uh, we would be very happy to get maybe any more questions that would have uh, come up during the the chat or if everything is answered then we can uh, we can I leave. think we should uh, mark did you have anything that you thought came up a bunch that might be worth answering I think uh, uh, as the uh, Uber expert on all things LA Network Manager P1. Uh, I think there was a bunch of different questions about uh, uh, uses of the LS10. I don't know if there was anything that uh, you thought would be worth uh, bringing up. Well, there's uh, often the question about how many switches can I cascade? Um, uh, that, that, does the latency change depending on the number of switches, things like that? So uh, the, the answer is, um, uh, no, uh, the latency doesn't change. Uh, the important uh, thing to do when you design your network is to make sure that an audio packet leaving a P1 and um, having to reach a number of amplified controllers does not cross more than 12 switches. And you need to count one switch inside the P1 and one switch inside the amp. So um, this is not very limiting actually, because uh, if uh, each of your LS10 is connected itself to a few LS10s, and these LS10s are themselves connected to a few LS10s and so on and so forth, you can build a system of more than 100 or uh, 200 uh, amplified controllers uh, while still respecting this guideline of no more than 12 switches in the path. Um, so, and um, the latency doesn't change because this is exactly what the presentation time is meant to uh, handle, if you wish. Um, in reality, an audio packet will probably make 0 0.1 millisecond to reach the closest amplifier controller, while um, it will take probably 1.5 millisecond to reach the furthest uh, amplified controller in the network that is uh, only available after crossing 10 switches, for instance. Well, this is not an issue because um, uh, all members of the network are aware of the time of the day and um, they will, uh, the, the receiving device, the listeners, will simply delay by exactly the necessary amount of time so that all audio is played exactly at the same time, regardless of the number of switches that were crossed. So to continue on my example, for the amplified controller that is the closest, this amplified controller will uh, uh, memorize or buffer uh, the audio packet for 1.9 milliseconds in order to make a presentation time of 2 milliseconds, while the furthest amplified controller at the other end of the network will buffer only for 0.5 milliseconds in order also to realize uh, to 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 uh, yeah to apply the two millisecond present time and every uh, listener will play exactly sample accurate the same audio content that's how avd works and uh, the, the benefit of the shared wall clock the shared time of day and the presentation time concept cool and i think uh, to follow up on that point mark yesterday we had a great presentation from nick payne and, and they had 186 le12x and many 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 switches and it wasn't a problem within that that 12 hop uh limit um so that that I mean, they were right near the end of it by the time it was said and done but at 186 le12x and many different delay and amp locations that was still well within that and uh and worked really really well for them um uh, I think that was it for today. I didn't see any other huge questions. Mark, thank you for that. Um, Tony, Thomas, uh, Guillaume, Alex, Sergey, and of course, last and not least, Etienne. It's a real pleasure to have everyone join us. I hope uh, this time that we're all uh, quarantined and segregated at home that we're able to improve our skills, learn some more information about how things work. Um, this is the last presentation for this week. Uh, we are going to take tomorrow off and Monday off. We will see you guys on Tuesday all about uh, Aliza next week. So thank you guys very much for joining us. Please have a great rest of your day. And uh, if you've missed any of these presentations, you can catch them on YouTube on our channel, uh, LA The Best Sound. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers.